In this video, I will present some comments on Taro's piece, a Movement Society, which discusses social movements, their uh, history, their significance um, for society, and some challenges they confront as they try to succeed in their task of mobilization and agenda setting. As you can see, I'm working from a Prezi with an overview of the entire uh, piece, uh, including the history of social movements in contemporary democracies. Uh, but in this video, I'm only going to address how social movements operate in a political environment, specifically the significance of opportunity structures, um, uh, organizational issues within the social movement, and also cycles of protest. In other words, uh, what happens to a social movement over time. So let's start with the opportunity structures. First of all, a social movement operates uh, within an environment, and we in political science, we referred to this as uh, you know, operating within an opportunity structure. Uh, this term can be understood as possibilities that exist in society to successfully mobilize a social movement and win the day, as it were. Uh, to take an extreme example, the opportunity structure of the Soviet Union was a very closed one. Uh, maybe even hermetically sealed, because no form of opposition to the government was allowed, uh, at least not before Perestroika, and, and that changed uh, the opportunity structure. Uh, unlike in totalitarian regimes, the opportunity structure of entrenched democracy is much more open, but how much more will vary greatly depending on which country we're talking about. Variables, variables include uh, uh, these four that I've um, uh, taken down here, so first is access to power, and this is about how easily uh, activists in the movement can access people in power. For example, the labor movement um, usually has an easier time accessing people in social democratic governments uh, than they have in conservative governments, uh, since uh, these two are, are historically allies. Uh, network structure uh, is also uh, important here. Uh, for instance, uh, in a closed corporatist system, uh, labor movement representatives will often have an easier time to access power because unions are established member of the network. However, uh, representatives from, say, the feminist movement uh, might not be represented uh, because they're not part of, of the uh, established uh, actors of the um, policy community. So that, that's why they would have a harder time accessing power. Uh, realignment of uh, political power uh, is another factor. Uh, this, uh, continuing with the example above, uh, we could say that the labor movement um, reps that could uh, access power with the social democratic government uh, could lose that access if the Social Democratic Party loses uh, an election to the Conservatives. Uh, and that can be part of the explanation for why labor unions often uh, tend to campaign against uh, the right during elections. Conflicts among elites uh, could be another factor in this. Um, a highly uh, well-organized cadre of elites will likely be less interested in letting uh, new actors uh, in uh, to their entrenched networks. Uh, but if there are two or three groups within the elites that start uh, a power struggle, for instance, one or two of these could actually see a social movement as an excellent baseball bat with which to bash the other guys. Uh, that can create opportunities uh, that can be exploited. Um, or uh, the power struggle uh, might lead to those elites being too busy uh, with their own affairs to, to notice the social movement and the threat it might pose to them, and that could allow the movement a chance to sideline uh, the old elites. Uh, available allies here is also important. Uh, this could be allies in government, like discussed before. It could be allies outside, like other social movements, for instance, uh, the environmental movement, the peace movement, and the anti-nuclear movement. They've all uh, historically had an easier time to find common ground. And when they can work together towards a common goal, they all grow stronger for it. Uh, the media could become another ally, uh, which could uh, really be, be key for uh, awareness building. Um, I've, uh, but uh, opportunities, uh, and these types of, of structures and, and possibilities in the environment, uh, they're necessary for social movements, but they're not sufficient for success. Another key factor that goes into this uh, is how the social movement itself 
is organized and structured, the organizational uh, composition of the movement. And this frame summarizes the basic conundrum for any social movement, really. On the one hand, it needs to be organized in some way. Uh, it has to because you, you, you need to be able to coordinate actions, you need to be able to keep some form of coherence within the movement so that every member stays on the same message. Uh, you need um, to be able to exploit successes the right way for maximum effective public policy. Uh, and this can't be done over a coffee break. It takes careful strategy, uh, careful planning. It takes logistics, media savvy, communication skills. Uh, there is a reason why political parties employ full-time media strategists for, for election planning. And there's also a reason why those kinds of people uh, get well paid. Uh, so this is really something that can't be ignored uh, for a social movement either. On the other hand, the more professional the movement becomes, the more distant it becomes from the grassroots that originally built it. And this is a problem for two reasons. One, if it loses touch uh, with the grassroots, it, it effectively ceases to be a social movement and becomes an interest group, you know, with charters, employees, board of directors, all those things that are typical for interest groups, but not necessarily social movements. Uh, also, social movements uh, build much of their claims making from the fact that they represent a very wide segment of people. Uh, in other words, that they are a movement uh, with, with a much wider scope than any single interest group can hope to achieve. If they lose that great grassroots touch, they also lose the legitimacy that comes from speaking from a broad base of people. So this is a balance then between these two polarities really that uh, all social movements have to strike. If they lean too much towards uh, uh, the grassroots, uh, they become too decentralized and they lose focus. If they le lean uh, uh, too much towards professionalism, they lose the grassroots. So I've entered here um, Occupy Wall Street as an example. Uh, confronting this conundrum. And it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, choice because it illustrates the point really well. Uh, because it really started out with a very strong grassroots image for itself early on. I don't know, that was the ideal of the movement and the attraction for many of those who joined. The consequence, however, was that the opponents immediately could criticize the movement for lack of direction, lack of clarity about what it wanted to accomplish, a lack of sense of purpose beyond we want something to change. In other words, uh, the opposition tapped into exactly this lack of professionalism, coordina coordination and structure that tends to plague movements who refuse to organize in that way for ideological reasons. This has happened to many movements historically. And they've all run into this issue of you know being too decentralized and not being able to uh, find coherence and uh, because of that losing efficiency in what they do. The last move, uh, point here I wanted to talk about um, is uh, the cycle of protests that a social movement can go through. Uh, I've uh, illustrated this with, with uh, this graph here from uh, the start. Uh, the movement gains uh, successes, it reaches the heights of power, and then comes a slump where it experiences reversals, and then it might remobilize again. And I'll, I'll take you through this step by step. Uh, because at each of these stages, uh, the social movement will, will confront challenges, uh, uh, even uh, when it, it starts out relatively successful and, and, and finds some balance between this, this conundrum of professionalism and uh, grassroots commitments that I just talked about. Um, so uh, Taro here chooses, in the piece, he chooses uh, 1789 as an interesting starting point because we're talking about a pro-democracy movement, a revolutionary movement at the time, uh, that obviously had some success because it ended uh, a monarchy and uh, then experienced uh, reversals and so on. Uh, but then uh, also was reinvigorated later on. The time span here might, to some, seem long. 1789 is the figure here, 1848 is the figure here. Uh, but it's actually quite a realistic time span for social movements. These are uh, 
bodies that work over several decades. If we look at the feminist movement, we can talk about generations of feminists. We can talk about suffragettes in the early 1900s being, uh, uh, you know, an early form of feminism uh, in, in the modern world. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the 1960s, which is, you know, 50 years later, um, which is a later generation of feminists. Uh, and, and they talk about women's issues in a slightly different way. It's no longer just focused on uh, voting, uh, but um, uh, it, it's, it's certainly uh, building on what the suffragettes had, had, had worked on, continuing the tradition. And so we can really talk about uh, a heritage and a, history, and a coherent history in that movement. So uh, first of all, uh, it starts out, it mobilizes, and uh, if it has success at this sta early stage, uh, what uh, likely will happen is some form of reaction. Now I've uh, noticed the, the uh, use the word repression here because that's of course what, what the uh, 1789 uh, movement uh, first encountered was the, the repression from uh, the monarchy. Um, uh, but even if, if the social movement is not existing in that type of, of uh, deeply undemocratic system, uh, a social movement, uh, even an entrenched democracy, uh, will experience some form of, of reaction from the powers that be. Uh, so there, there will be a, a counter movement of some sort. If the movement survives this, uh, then uh, there is uh, and keeps on being successful, then there is actually room for uh, taking part in agenda setting, taking uh, affecting public policy, and engaging in reforms, which is why this is the next word here. And that's a new stage in the existence of the social movement. It, it's really involved in this type of, of work because now it actually has influence uh, on public policy. Uh, and here also comes the next hurdle for the social movement. It might become too successful for its own good. If members of the movement uh, uh, see the ensuing uh, reforms as a case of mission accomplished, they might simply pack up and go home and stop being activists in the movement. That's why the next key word here is demobilization. So let's have a closer look at that. Um, at this stage, a number of forces can undermine a social movement in very detrimental ways. Um, first, uh, there is simply fatigue. Uh, think again about Occupy Wall Street. How long can you actually camp out in a public space and effectively put the rest of your life on hold? Uh, most people can sympathize, most of the members of, of the movement can sympathize and take part for a while, uh, but this while can often be measured in a time span of weeks or at best months. Certainly not years, and, and we've already looked at this time graph, which spans decades. Uh, so uh, you might actually really need years and decades to bring substantial change to a social issue. Uh, so retaining that energy within the mem membership over a long period of time is far from easy. Uh, the second here uh, connects uh, really back to the issue of organizational structure. Now, regard uh, factions and factional rivalry can, can develop um, just uh, if it's leaderless. Well, uh, John Stewart's Daily Show uh, made some jokes about uh, the Occupy Wall Street camp in New York City and how it was divided between different groups who resided in different parts of the camp and sometimes struggled to get along. Uh, now, if there is a leader, uh, this uh, leader figure might turn out to be controversial among some groups, and, and we, we possibly should expect that. Uh, this is uh, a movement, is, is uh, a type of uh, social actor that has a really wide scope, so we can't really expect a movement to uh, agree, with all the members of a movement to agree with everything uh, at all times. So some form of controversy will probably be uh, developing. So what should then be done? Uh, some leaders have reacted to opposition with repression within the movement, expelling critics and filling significant positions with uh, naysayers. Uh, that method often leads to quick marginalization of the movement because it loses the movement character, like, like being professionalized uh, in, the, in the previous frame. Uh, but on the other hand, trying to placate too many voices within the movement can lead right back to a lack of focus and expending a whole lot of energy on discussions within the movement when the focus should be on getting the agenda implemented in society at large. 
uh, repression placation here uh, also uh, to some extent relates to government reactions. Uh, repression might uh, start again and be successful. Or on the other hand, placation, so giving the movement a seat at the table, refers to uh, it being too successful. Mission accomplished, let's go home. So uh, social movements that experience these troubles uh, will notice how, how their membership will drop and how their activity will drop. And then uh, events in, in the environment can uh, lead to uh, a reversal and a renewal of energy within the movement. And um, that can remobilize uh, the movement and it can start uh, working effectively again uh, to achieve its goals. So that's an overview then of uh, these uh, particular um, features and, and challenges that a social movement have to uh, confront uh, from opportunity structures to internal organization to what happens over time. I hope uh, you found this video useful.